This is the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast, where we're very, very passionate about helping you become the leader that other people love to follow. If you're regular with this, you may say, wait a minute, it's not the first Thursday of the month. And the reason is because this is a bonus episode. In fact, in this episode, this will be the first time we've ever done an interview. And I'm incredibly honored and excited to interview one of my closest friends and one of the most innovative leaders that I know anywhere in the world, Bobby Grunewald. Hey, thank you, Craig. It's an honor to be here. It's great to have you on. I could tell him a little bit about some of the impressive stuff that you've done. Uh, you've been featured uh, in the New York Times and CNN, NBC, Harvard, Harvard Review. You're named uh, by Fast Company. This is one of my favorites, by Fast Company, one of the most 100 innovative and creative business leaders in America. Very impressive. Uh, we could go through all those kind of things, many of the businesses you built and sold. But to me, what is very impressive is your maximum bench press weight, which is <laughs> how much? Can you tell us? You're going to seriously ask me I'm that. I'm 100% asking. ask you. We're, we're starting with bench press. What's your max? 345. 345. That is impressive. <laughs> Forget the 100 most top creative, innovative people in America. I don't That's know if I could ever do weight. it again, though. I think that was a one and done thing <laughs> for me. That's pretty impressive. But So on a more serious note, we uh, in our last episode, we talked about the theme of innovation. And you've been named and called by people all over the world as one of truly one of the most innovative minds before we talk about innovation, can you tell me just a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, you know, I was an entrepreneur um, first. I actually was in school studying finance, and I started um, two different technology companies. The first was back in 1996. It was a web hosting company. I sold it in 1998, um, had some success with that, and then went on and started another company uh, where we... Um, had an online content portal, an online community, and sold that in 1999 to a company that Goldman Sachs took public in early 2000. So I started as an entrepreneur before I then eventually moved into a role at the church. So people may not be able to track with you on the dates, but so you were in college starting businesses and would have barely been out of college before you sold your second tech company. That's correct. I was, was between ages 19 and 23, I think, is what how old I was back then. Yeah, most people were just trying to get out of bed, and uh, you were <laughs> building and selling companies. So uh, along those way, I mean, that's, that, that's innovative, just to come up with the idea to execute, to build a company, um, to make it attractive enough to someone else wants to buy it. That's, that's impressive. In, in the last episode, we talked about the four essential qualities of innovative leaders. And I'd like to to recap those and then talk through them with you. Uh, we talked about every innovative leader needs a problem to solve. A problem is actually just an opportunity if we kind of reframe it. They need limited resources. Most people think they need more, but it's actually fewer resources that spark and drive innovation. The third thing is they need a willingness to fail when many people aren't. They're playing it safe. And then finally, you need a crazy idea. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many years ago. I think it's a little over 10 that you came to me with a crazy idea that has now impacted millions and millions of lives. Our church was honored to create the YouVersion Bible app, which we're celebrating an anniversary you can tell us about. It's now on 330 million devices, all from a local church. It was all your idea. Tell me about the story behind this crazy idea. Sure, well, the, uh, the original idea um was actually birthed in the Chicago airport in uh, 2006. I was in a long TSA security line at the airport, and I'm not sure why God used that moment, but in that security line that day, I was thinking about this question of, I wonder if there's a way that we could leverage technology to help people engage with the Bible. Particularly, I was thinking about me, um, because I had struggled to consistently read the Bible, even though I desired to, I wanted to, um, I just couldn't quite find the interface with it that fit with kind of the the busyness and the travel and the way that my life was at the time. So there in the airport that day, this idea came for you version. Um, the original idea was actually for a website. And um, and so that was kind of where the idea was birthed. And of course, then I came and talked to you and, and others on the team about that after I got back from the airport that day. Right, so essentially you just said what thought number one is there was a problem to solve. And that is, 
you wanted to engage consistently in Scripture, and you weren't doing so. Um, and so this this problem became an idea of creating a website. Uh, talk to me a little bit about limited resources, because uh, everyone has limited resources. We only have so much time in the day. We only have so much access to capital, to, to money. We've only got so many people we're working with. Um, if you go all the way back to 2006, we were much more limited as a church with resources then. Many people would say that's a problem, but it wasn't a problem to you. Yeah, no, I think I've found that that limited resources are oftentimes the things that drive you know innovative ideas. Uh, and we certainly were faced with limited resources. We didn't have a team that was was ready to build a website. Um, we r- pretty quickly realized that we actually didn't even have the right relationships at the time um, because we didn't realize we needed to license the Bible text to be able to build this website. So I began to try to think creatively about people that I knew um, that I thought might have access to the people that, that could make those types of decisions. Um, There's a, a person here in our community named Mark Green who um, had a series of Christian or a, a group of Christian bookstores. I thought Mark might know some people, and I didn't really know Mark, so trying to work to get towards uh, to get in touch with him so we could figure out how to overcome that obstacle. So each step along the way at the beginning, we found that we really had very little. But my my role was to cast vision for this to really kind of find those people and find the resources that God could use to do it. But if we had started saying, hey, we need to have all this in place before we could begin, uh, we would never have started because we had so little at the time and and so much that we needed. So, Bobby, you said that we were going to create a website, which is true. Uh, You have to be willing to fail in order to be innovative because, you know, sometimes the great idea the breakthrough idea isn't the first idea. Sometimes it's, you have to you have to fail along the way. Talk to me about the willingness to fail and you know, did our first attempt, was it a home run or what happened? Yeah, so we started with that idea for the website in 2007, launched the website in September of 2007. And just a few months in, really even a couple months in, we realized that it, it didn't work. I mean, it technically worked but it didn't change how I read the Bible. In fact, I, I went to the website to use it only because we created it, not because it naturally was something that worked. And you mentioned the, that fear of failure. Um, you know, a lot of times I've, I've heard that used to reference the, the fear of starting something new because you're afraid you might fail so you don't start it. I've actually found that there's a lot of people that don't have any trouble starting something, but they have trouble acknowledging when it fails to actually admit that it was a failure. And so that was something that we're not afraid of doing. So just a few months in, after we had invested all this time and, and all this energy trying to build the relationships and put everything together to build this website, um, we knew it wasn't working, and so we said it failed. And we were willing to shut it down, planned to shut it down. This was early 2008. Um, but that willingness to say it failed caused us to evaluate why it failed. And in the process of evaluating why it failed, we discovered that one of the things we noticed was we were using our Blackberries all the time, our, our smartphones back in 2008, and we were actually using our computer very little naturally during the day. And so we thought, what if we redesigned the website so that it could be visible on a Blackberry, on a smartphone? And that failure and the willingness to admit that it failed is actually what led us to the idea that today people know is version. So I think that's brilliant. I want to stay there for a minute because I think a lot of times we do have an idea and we get emotionally attached to it and we're unwilling to call it what it is, a failure. And if we hang on to it too long, it may rob us from leveraging whatever we learn from that, which could be the next idea. So it failed. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the things that we do today that are most innovative, many of the things were born on the other side of a failure. You came in and you said, we should pull the plug on this thing. And we were literally just, you know, weeks away from doing it. And you came up with the crazy idea of what if. Sure. Sure. And that was exactly, so that failure led to the idea of, of making it work on a phone. And we did that. It's very simple, but it actually changed how I was engaging with the Bible. You could kind of, you could see the result of it in, almost instantly. You know, I, I was reading the Bible in places I hadn't before because I had my BlackBerry with me. And Apple announced that they were going to make it possible to develop apps for this new phone called the iPhone. And they're going to create something called an app store. And so we thought with what we see happening uh, already on, on the BlackBerry, what if we could develop an app? So we moved very quickly. Um, we found a 19-year-old on our team 
who loved Apple, and we said, could you help us build an app? And he he learned, nobody knew how to build apps. So limited resources. Exactly. We're, we're, we're not going to Silicon Valley and finding an expert. We're going downstairs and talking to a 19-year-old kid. Who loved Apple. Who that loved was, Apple. That, that was about the only two, requirement, two <laughs> can, requirements back Can you then. build an app? Exactly. And so we had, ba- the, nothing about this really makes sense, you know, in many ways when you think about kind of logically what you think it would take to do it. Um, but we were just willing to take a risk and try something because we felt like there was an opportunity we could seize. We just thought if the Bible could be among the first group of apps in the App Store, that that might be something that God could use. That there might be a lot more people interested in reading it. And so we had no idea if Apple was going to approve the app. We had no idea if we could successfully build it. Um, we submitted the app to Apple in June. Um, and then on July 10th, 2008, the App Store launched, and to our surprise, the Bible app was among the very first 200 free apps that were available in the store that day. It was a Thursday in 2008, and the day that this podcast is being released, I believe, is the 10th anniversary of that day. Mm-hmm. And so, a part-time 19-year-old kid releases the app. The first weekend, what did we see? So between Thursday night and Sunday morning, we saw 83,000 people download and install this on their iPhone. And what was even more incredible was that they're actually opening it multiple times a day. We could see from our, our data and our analytics that, that people were actually using it, which was huge for us. And that blew our mind. We had absolutely no idea that that, that, that was going to happen. And so what was kind of a side project for that 19-year-old on Friday when he left, we made that his full-time job on Monday when he came back in. Yeah, congratulations, you now now have a full-time exactly. job. Exactly. So fast forward 10 years later, tell me about, before you tell me what comes next, but tell me about the organization now. What does the team look like? And, uh, and then I'm gonna try to track back and see how do we get from here to there. Sure, so one of the things about Uversion is that we've designed it to be non-commercial, it's completely free, it's supported by our church and by outside donors that, that give to make it possible. Um, and, and so the team is built with about 35 full-time people that are on staff. The scope of it, of course, has grown very significantly over the years, but we have over a thousand volunteers on top of that that are involved in, in helping to make it work. So that when you see the scale and scope of it, no one would rationally think you could have 35 people mm-hmm. that would lead that, but we do it because we have so many volunteers and so many people that have stepped up to make that possible. I think that that might be a word of encouragement to some people as well, because this is, I mean, this is a major um, organization, and yet there's a thousand people around the world volunteering. Um, that's an innovative idea in itself, just to look for new ways to leverage um, people's ideas, wisdom, time, and capacity. So, uh, with that in mind, what do you see coming in the future? We've you've built one of the strongest apps in the world. It's, it's on hundreds of millions of devices. What, what's next? Well, for us, we have several new features that we'd love to add to the app, and we've been adding and improving over time. And we're basically trying very hard to make it the best experience possible in whatever language or whatever country that it's in. Um, We just are announcing that we have a brand new app that we're launching. Um, It's really um, a pretty amazing technology that the team came up with, and it basically allows you to take a photo of anything, and it will recognize the objects that are in the photo and then it will find the best and the most appropriate verses based on the objects that are in the photo. We did this because we saw so many people taking verses and adding images to them and posting them on social media. We have about half a million people every day that do that. And so we saw the momentum of that and we thought, what if we create a tool that makes it easier for them to see how the Bible connects to their everyday life, to help them rediscover those moments that, that they've ha- they have in their life. So we actually make it possible to go backwards through your camera roll too and to take photos that you've already taken and find the best and most appropriate verses and then then create beautiful renderings of those verses on top of the photos and make it possible to share. So we think this will really help people see connection um, to scripture all around them and give almost a, a different lens of how they see the world. And that's why the name of the app is called Bible Lens. Bible Lens. So if someone takes a picture of their hand and they're wearing a wedding ring, a verse might pop up. Exactly, it would recognize the wedding ring, recognize they're married, might, it would pull from a verse that would talk about marriage or talk about loving your wife, because um, it would recognize if it's a man's hand or a woman's hand. There's, It's really amazing um, how the technology works. That is amazing, and so there's a, around a half a million or so scripture verses posted today through the YouVersion Bible app, 
and this could be explosive, what happens after this. Yeah, we, we believe that we'll see that number go into the millions every day um, with a tool like this. But um, again, we had no idea what to expect when we did the Bible app originally. And, and similarly, we have you know what we think this can be incredible and how God will use it. But at the same time, we have no idea what it's gonna do. So talk to some listeners right now that are stuck. Uh, they're facing a problem, they don't have a lot of money, their staff is limited, and they don't know how to get from an idea in a security line to an organization with staff members and volunteers. What what would you tell them that might inspire them off center? Yeah, well for us, you know, each step along the way was a step. Um, we, if I had known kind of what would become today when we were getting started, um, I probably would have messed it all up if I would have tried. I would have tried to take the shortcut to the to the end and say I need to build a team of 32 people. Or I need to have a thousand volunteers. Uh, instead, we kind of took each step one step at a time, looked at the resources that we did have, you know, which wasn't much, and figured out the best way we could leverage them. A lot of times we relied on partners on relationships, but my role was really to cast vision for this to to essentially sell people on the idea. Um, to get to get great feedback from others, to improve it. Um, I, I've not written a single line of code for the Bible app. I'm not a developer. Most people presume that I am and that I wrote the original app and I didn't. I just found the 19 year old. You know, I found the resources um, that I could find uh, and, and cast vision for it. And I think a lot of times people feel like they need to have all those things in place before they can begin. We just kind of stepped into it step by step. And each time we were evaluating, like I said, whether it was working or not and making adjustments if we needed to. And I think as long as you're kind of taking those steps each time, being willing to hold it very loosely and say, you know, if this works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and make those changes. I think that's what just encourage people to kind of take the next step and not sort of be focused necessarily on the ending. I think that's really, really wise. And sometimes the ending is overwhelming, but if you can take the next step, then with each progressive step, you have the better ability to attract the right people and the resources start following success if you just get the ball moving a little bit. Absolutely. You know, I had a, a question I get asked a lot is if I went back in time and told the 20 year old version of me, had had some advice and wanted to say something to the 20 year old version of me, what would I say if I went back in time and did that? And I thought about it a lot and I thought I'd say absolutely nothing because. I'm pretty certain that if I had known kind of what the destination would be, I would have messed it all up mm -hmm. a long time ago. Instead, it's more about being in the moment of recognizing what step God wants you to take today and making sure that you're just stepping into it each step along the way. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what little steps of faithfulness, sacrifice, trust along the way over a 10-year period can become amazing. Absolutely. So I wanna just tell you congratulations on uh, the 10-year anniversary. It was really fun to me is that I get to be a part of the organization that gives this Bible app away. Uh, it wasn't my idea. And it, uh, to the leaders out there, you don't have to have every great idea. You have people around you that have great ideas. What's really fun, I think the Bible lens is going to be explosive. That wasn't your idea. Mm -hmm. That was someone on your team's idea. Right. And so as a leader, we don't have to come up with every great idea. We just have to have the wisdom to recognize it and the courage to act on it. With that in mind, I'd love to let our listeners know how they can find out more about you. You may not tell them, but we can find you in the gym trying to go for 345 pounds on the bench press. But what, what are other ways they can find out more? You know, I've, um, I've been telling uh, the story about what God's doing um, through our church and through YouVersion and through technology um, through social media. And so people can find me and follow me I'm at Bobby Gwald on pretty much every social media platform, uh, Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook. And, and so I'd encourage people if they wanna kind of track what's going on, they could certainly find me there. And they can see you at the gym. 345 <laughs> is the goal. Congratulations on the 10 years and uh, thanks for all you've done. Uh, Craig, I just wanna say one yep. more thing about you actually though, because I know you, uh, um, you wouldn't say this, but I, I certainly can. You're, as a leader, a very empowering leader, and you talked about the fact that this idea didn't come from you, um, and yet God used our church to do it. And you created an environment where people like myself can actually thrive. And, um, and that's remarkable you know, as a leader. I used to run companies when I, I started them and ran them, and I'm more than honored to work under your leadership. And it's because you're a very empowering leader and, um, and I know that you, you wouldn't talk about yourself in this way on the podcast, but since I have a microphone, I wanted to say that about you. So thank you for your leadership 
the YouVersion Bible app, Bible Lens, all those things happen because of the environment that you built. And so thank you for being such a great leader. Well, thank you. That sincerely means a lot. And I thought you were going to tell them how much I can bench press, but you didn't. So uh, no. we're good to go. <laughs> so it's uh, at Bobby G. Wald. And love you to follow him. And I'm grateful for all that you've done. In the next episode, we're going to talk about how to inspire people toward action. Great leaders inspire, but we don't just inspire people, we inspire them toward action. So uh, if this is helpful, please share it. Uh, thank you for sharing on social media. Invite others to do this with you. Uh, rate this and subscribe to the podcast uh, if you can. That way it'll come to you every single month. What do you need to do? Be yourself as a leader. Don't try to be somebody else. Be yourself because people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. Thank you for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. If you're enjoying learning from Craig on this podcast, you can show your support by subscribing, rating and reviewing on iTunes, and sharing with your friends on social media. In the meantime, you can check out Craig's five favorite episodes of this podcast by going to life.church slash favorite five. And we'll send you a leader guide that'll help you discuss concepts and insights from every episode with your team. Until next time, thanks for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast.